All right, it's finally here. The Anchor 240 watt power adapter. This is the biggest from this company yet. I've held on to it for a while and not sure exactly why, but it's time to put it through its paces. I'm going to talk about the charger, what it does, what it can charge, and how good it is at those things. In general, the performance will be explored and compared with the claims on the box. The longevity and thermal performance will be explored as well as some exploration as to why this charger will probably last just about as long as every other charger, almost entirely based on one part. The charger or power adapter, same thing, will be compared to near competition as well. And I will be testing some other 240 watt chargers, but we will see if they get videos or not. I'd like to make only positive reviews from now on. Yeah, that would mean a lot less videos. Or companies need to make better products. Ha 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 ha. There's a smiley face in my script. How do I read that? Oh, now it's sticking his tongue out at me. Great. In this series, I try to answer the question. Which power adapter do I want to get? As always, ask questions if you don't understand something. The performance is measured and compared. If you want to see more like this, see the links in the description. Thanks to my patrons and channel supporters. The detailed data is on Patreon if you are interested. Okay, so how do I do this? Make an Anchor video entertaining and interesting. Oh wait, it's an Anchor product, so I don't have to do anything. These are the only ones that get views and all YouTube recommends that I make. Today, I have the Anchor Prime 240 watt GAN desktop charger with four ports, A2342. The packing is mostly cardboard, so that's not bad. This adapter has three USB-C ports and one USB-A port. I've heard from some people that they won't buy a power adapter if it still has a USB-A port. So I guess those people will have to keep looking right off the bat. For everyone else, keep watching. I think this is going to get interesting. The user manual has some claims and modes of operation. There's some specific omissions here that are interesting. This does have some efficiency values as well, which if it measured at these values, it wouldn't meet the requirements for energy efficiency standards, but I think these are worst case, assuming like low line voltage of Japan, so probably 85 volts in. The poor circuits will be working overtime to make up for that low line voltage. So in reality, this adapter gave me a nice surprise. PPS or programmable power supply modes were on the table. And not only that, this is the first adapter I found that goes fully to five amps in these PPS modes and can really charge three 45 watt PPS ports at the same time, well within the wheelhouse for this thing. It does lack a 12 volt mode on the USB-C ports. The USB-A port did have some interesting modes though, like the ability to do five volts and 4.5 amps. So I wonder if this would be able to do the higher output required for something like a Raspberry Pi, but you'd need a USB-A to C adapter, and that adapter would have to convert the mode from a QC mode to a PD mode. Annoying, but technically capable. Another thing that will tick people off is the non-removable power cord. They carefully hide this in the marketing material. The cord is fixed in place with a rubberized drain relief. Yeah, for $200, it's a little screw you. They could have used their fancy proprietary connector from the new power strip thing, but no luck. When flipping the adapter around, you see lots of text and different marks on the product. For one, we see a six in a circle. This is indicative of compliance with the Department of Energy requirements. In this case, the power adapter has an idle power usage of 0.14 watts and an average DOE efficiency of 91%. This exceeds the requirements, but who cares? Efficiency and idle power usage? These numbers are tiny and insignificant on my electric bill. Well, it's more of a big picture problem than a small picture problem, so bigger than you. The issue is there are easily a billion or more devices plugged in in just the USA. So a billion times 0.2 watts versus a billion times 0.1 for idle power matters. For efficiency, a billion times the loss at 89% versus a billion times the loss of 91% efficiency is huge. So it's small, insignificant, I mean really meaningless on a one person case, but times the planet's population? This matters, and Anchor did well here, making one of the best performing products on the market for this power level. This product has a few safety listings on the back as well. This is listed under Tuvsud, with three countries, Japan, the United States, and Canada. Not bad. With the fixed power cable, this makes sense. This basically means the power adapter passes some testing criteria related to isolation, safety, and dangerous conditions. It doesn't mean it will last longer or is better at being a power supply though as I've seen some non-listed power supplies that have performed very well. The power cord is two-prong and non-removable. This thing is heavy. It comes with a little base stand, and with the heat it needs to dissipate, I recommend using this to keep the adapter away from other surfaces by at least six inches. No earth bonding to worry about, but what about leakage current? This is the electricity that leaks through the unit and gives you that tingling feeling while working on your laptop. The isolation performance of this product is excellent. 
The data I could find for dry skin and perceptible current is one milliamp. Depending on the wetness of skin, this could be much lower. I think this needs to be updated desperately because I can detect 250 microamps pretty easily. The measured leakage current of this Anker 240 watt adapter was a mere 153 microamps at 270 volts RMS, which is very impressive. This means you should be tingle free using this product anywhere in the world. It doesn't meet medical grade requirements and it doesn't claim to. For context, Bassius and Zateshi are bad choices for 240 volts. They don't meet the 250 microamp threshold. Fine on 120 volts, which is probably why I never had any problem, but bad above that. Anyway, if you want to add some tests to this, let me know. This tester goes up to 5,000 volts RMS, so can do some high pot testing or damage some things for sure. Also, don't try this at home. This power adapter is heavy. At almost 900 grams, it is almost as heavy as the Ugreen 300 watt adapter, but with 60 less watts. It is fairly compact for that power level though, so impressive from that perspective. Here are the weights and size comparisons to some other products. The Slim Q gets a mention here for being nearly the same volume, but extremely light. The space optimization is impressive, but the weight on the anchor is a lot. I would use the base to keep surfaces exposed for heat transfer also. Next, I look at the thermal performance of this charger. It is always the part that gets me worried that something is going to blow up because these get hot. Let's face it. You want it smaller, that means they get hotter. In this case, after half an hour, things look more or less reasonable, mid 50s of degrees Celsius. After an hour or even longer, as it turns out, it achieves thermal equilibrium and sits around 65 degrees C. This is hot. I mean, I actually got a mild burn after the test because I didn't hot potato enough, but it's within the safety limits. The fact is that it didn't shut down and post one hour, it didn't continue to get even hotter, which was a positive result. This is another reason every percent of efficiency matters. Okay, so it gets hot, but it's stabilized. Does that mean this thing is gonna last forever? Time for a sidebar. So there's one component that is a big reason why this will fail, and every other one of these will fail when being used under full load conditions. The failure is often because of one component, the capacitor. It's always the capacitor. In this case, an electrolytic capacitor. So who cares, right? Well, you care because your stuff breaks early because of these parts. The power supply needs these parts to be able to supply the larger output power to make your laptops and phones buzz along so you can watch the video. Are you still watching? I hope so. This is the part where I accidentally trick you into learning something. Damn, did I say that out loud? Oops. So why does this matter? I don't want to get too far into the weeds here, but this is a data sheet for a capacitor and this is why this matters. These have a thermal lifetime. They tell you in the data sheet. You run this hot, this premium high temperature rated capacitor stuffed deep into the power adapter surrounded by other hot things is only rated for 7,000 hours. That's less than a year. That's for a premium one. If you use a cheaper one, don't expect it to last that long. They give a chart in this example where hotter it gets, the less time you get. It is hot inside these power supplies, real hot. So they are pushed to the limit and operated on the edge. The capacitors have liquid in them and they literally dry out. As they dry out, they lose both the ability to store energy and the ability to deliver whatever energy they have stored. So lose, lose, your power adapter or charger doesn't work anymore. If you are lucky, it just stops working. If you are unlucky, it breaks something. More than not, it will hiccup. Go on and off and on and off and on and off. These are cheap components, but so are some alternate components like multi-layer ceramic capacitors. These are dry components and often subject to a huge range of testing to make sure they are reliable. These components won't suffer the same fate, but can break in other ways. There are ways to combat that too, like using two in series at a 90 degree angle to combat bending mode failures. There are plenty of designs out there that happen to be high reliability designs. I happen to have a high reliability power supply I was planning to show in a video, but never got around to it. This power supply does away with all of the electrolytic capacitors. This uses MLCC and film capacitors instead. Again, more expensive, but yeah, they're gonna last longer. There are better control and operating techniques now that can use smaller capacitors and make them go further in operation. So is it time for manufacturers to stop being cheap or is this just too far to ask for a product that can handle the heat and last? This module will be getting tested eventually. Anchor does better than some here by being generous with the capacitor value. And most of the time you aren't asking for full power from a power supply, so it won't be that hot. So how long will it last will depend on your use of the supply. 
being a 240 watt supply and being relatively efficient, I expect a good long life from this charger if it isn't being used at more than 100 to 150 watts regularly. For a high reliability application like LED signage, is it really cheaper to keep paying the repair company to come out and replace the light ballasts versus just having it work for its expected lifespan? There's a valued argument both ways. I'm not saying one is correct or incorrect. Okay, sidebar over. Time to compare some comparison numbers now. And looking at the idle power data for this thing in comparison with others of the higher wattage variety, this thing does great. For 240 watts, it's the class leader. Like, no comparison really. This means the power supply is really relying on the storage of that little auxiliary capacitor too. Every once in a while it draws a little pulse. At 0.1 watt out, it increases to just 0.4 watts in. This is like leaving an Apple lightning cable plugged in. The idle runs a bit high on 230 volts, so would struggle with the EU specification, but no one else in this class is good either. In terms of the average performance, this adapter's average efficiency, specifically looking at the DOE6 efficiency, that means 25 to 100% load, this power adapter does great. It is a top tier performer. This is plotted versus power quality, which is just too much for one video. To put it simply, it's also very good. All of this performance has to come at some kind of cost, and it does. This thing is expensive. It's $200 at the time of writing. That's so much money. I guess context. It's like two high quality power adapters in one, so $100 each. Is that more palatable? I'd rather have a 140 watt adapter and a 100 watt adapter separate so I can take one with me. I guess that's where it falls apart. What's the point of this thing? Value aside, this anchor charger is quite good. Surprisingly good. From low power to high power. It's like a 717 and a prime 100 watt adapter got merged into one case and then a non-removable power cord got added. But that's also the problem. You can buy both of those separately for less money. That performance, like every other compact high wattage adapter, is questionable over time. This is because of the heat. The hotter they are, the faster some components inside will fail. Whether alternate components can make the power adapter more reliable, but what maybe also make it larger, are reasons to keep the status quo. This is considered a necessary trade-off for a consumer product. Make it small, compact, and cheap. Oh, except for that last part. Anchor has actually done something positive here, though. This power adapter is not bad. Whether on 230 volts or 120 volts, 50 or 60 hertz, this adapter is efficient and performs at the top level among the competition. It stabilized at a hot temperature, but acceptable after an hour at full load, and it didn't shut down after that. It is riding that edge, yeah. Are you going to use this ever under that abusive condition? No. And I'm glad Anchor put in the effort to make sure that this adapter can survive tests like that that are really beyond realistic. Meeting the claims on the box is all it's about. This charger does it and charges a premium for that. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video. 240 watts on one port. Hey, get out of the way. Goodbye.